my fourth ever video got a million views. I knew that I would be good at it and I knew that I would make more money. I kind of quit the job that I had currently, which was door knocking for solar. My mindset is very arrogant. I think I'm the best at everything. I am a prime advocate to not batch your content. They treat social media as a sales, like it's a paid ad. That's probably the biggest mistake. No hustle, worship here, we're a different breed. Action is what we got if action is what you need. Content capitalists, we're breaking the mold. Cause the old ways fade, new stories to the toe. So content capitalists, get to the press. This is the Content Capitalist Podcast, and my name is Ken Okazaki. There are as many ways to make money with content as there are people doing it. So listen in as my clients, past, present, and future, unpack how they crack the code to making a million dollars a year or more while capitalizing on their content. Let's get started. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Content Capitalist Podcast, where I have deep dive conversations with people who are crushing it with video, content creation, and especially figured out how to you know turn that into an income stream for themselves. Uh, my guest today, I he started popping up my feed maybe six months ago, and I was like, who is this guy? Don't know who he is, but I paid attention because his content was like really quality, it was fire. And right now he's sitting on top of Instagram, 269,000 followers as of today, that's October, early October, 2023. And the comments and the engagement are telling me that he's doing the right thing. So I want you to welcome Devin Jatho to the Content Capitalist Show. Devin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ken. I appreciate you coming here. Now, we could go over a lot of things, but uh, right now, could you just kind of give us an overview of what is it you actually do? Uh, from the looks of it, you're super young. Uh, from the looks of it on social media, you're super successful. Uh, but tell me, what is your business? Who do you help and how do you help them? So the quick little elevator pitch that we like to say is we make millionaires famous on social media. Uh, you are right. I'm 19. I'm kind of young. Um, but right now, we're currently servicing entrepreneurs just trying to help them build and monetize their personal brand. Perfect. I remember when I was 19, most likely I was just sitting up all night playing video games. I probably wasn't doing something quite as productive as this. So I wish that you were around as my you know, next door neighbor or friend to kind of show me what's possible. Um, tell me about like, why did you start an uh, Instagram channel or you know, social media presence in the first place? Was it with business in mind or was it just kind of for fun to share random things with your friends? It was never fun, man. I always want to make money at the beginning. Um, so what kind of inspired me to do it is I was always an advocate for watching Shark Tank. I've always had like the entrepreneur mindset, like since like second grade, and I was trying to sell things in school. But to fast forward to now or fast forward around to whenever I started, I used to watch Shark Tank every single day. And then one day, uh, as a guy was coming up to pitch, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, asked a guy before they asked for the before he offered the offer for the investment, he asked how many social media followers do you currently have for the brand? And at that point, it kind of stuck with me that this is important. And if I can get other people to if I can add value to people that want to increase the following, I would get paid in the back end. Amazing. So that stuck with you. And you just uh, did you right away just dive into that and start playing around? So I started watching this guy named Stephen Miller. And at the beginning, I thought I had like this grand idea that nobody else was doing. But then as I started to look a little bit more forward into it, I saw that there was a bunch of guys doing it quite well. I just kind of saw a gap within the market that no one was really doing it the way I wanted to do it. Um, I kind of wanted to take the Hermosi route and it's worked out well. Okay. And when you say Hormozy route, is that like giving the best information up front for free? Is that what yeah, you mean by I that? Mean, Whenever I create content, I kind of keep that in mind. Um, my whole ordeal is to build up enough positive reinforcement. Are you familiar with the BF Skinner experiment? No, why don't you tell me? Okay, so there was an American psychologist named BF Skinner, and he was famous for doing the Skinner box. Now within this, they had two different boxes. You have the positive reinforcement box, and then you have the negative reinforcement box. So within the positive reinforcement box, basically he took a bunch of starving rats and he stuck them into this box. Now within this box, there was a lever. And within this lever, whenever you pulled it, uh, a, reward or a reward would fall from the sky. But then being stubborn rats, it would be food. So basically, they built up a relationship with this lever as the positive lever, because obviously, they get food whenever they pull it. I wanted to resemble my content across, if you, were, if you see my page pop up on your free page, you at least know that you're going to get something positive from it. There's going to be some sort of value. Then on the flip side, you have the negative reinforcement, which is what made BF Skinner controversial, is... He would take the rats and put them into a box that would shock them until they pulled the lever. And then from that, they built up the negative reinforcement of being in the box. And the only thing that was positive about the box was pulling the lever. I do not want my content to be 
stained with this sense of me trying to sell you something, just more so I talk about what I have to give, with, which is education, and then you can pay me if you want the implementation. I love that. I love that. I, and out of everybody who I'm seeing on social media, you're one of the most well-researched people. Like I, I watch your stuff and <clears throat> some of the stuff you explain in like 60 seconds or 15 seconds, even some of them, I recognize that. I'm like, oh, that's from this study or that's from this school of thought or that's from this expert. And, but then you just keep going with more and more and more and more. And I sense that you have a really broad range of places you research, study and, and, and people you learn from. Could you tell me about like your background that got you or, or where are you getting these ideas? How much are you researching? Who are you learning from? So I'm not one that really watches all that much content. And then as well as I don't have any background, like I'm 19, uh, I'm not in college and I barely paid attention in school. Um, typically I will have a sense of logic across like, I feel like it's more so a common sense. And then from that, I'll try to reverse engineer the common sense with something to back it up. So for example, uh, one of the most viral videos that I made was how to get a bigger follower button. Now I knew that a bigger follower button would probably increase the conversions of followers, but I had nothing that would back up what I was saying. And then as well as it was an assumption. So to confirm the assumption, I would go do research and look up ChatGPT is really good uh, whenever you want to look for these kind of things, but I would go look up something to basically back my assumption and then make it somewhat of a fact. I love it. I love it. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Now, something that uh, a lot of people that come to me, and by the way, I, I have, a, you know, we do something similar. We create content for a lot of our clients. Yeah. And it wasn't until just recently that <clears throat> I started making anything for myself. So I, I feel kind of like a newbie. But um, a lot of questions come up where people are just like, well, what's the ROI? How am I going to make money with this? Could you tell me your story of how long it took from when you started creating content to when someone showed up at your, you know, literally like your inbox saying, hey, can I pay you to help me out? Like, what was that gap of time? And how, how, how did you feel during that period? Okay. So I would say for me, it's a little bit different because my fourth ever video got a million views. So it was like immediately I kind of got that first ever DM, but I would say the snowball effect whenever it was like more so of a, a normal occurrence was probably around two months into creating content. And then from that, um, it kind of just came in all at once. At the beginning, I was selling like maybe $150 coaching calls for like 90 minutes and I will take four hours of preparation before the call just to make sure that it was spot on X, Y, and Z. And then around January, I started creating content, like my first ever video in October. Then around January, um, I had my first ever guy, I forget his name. He never actually facilitated, like he never actually gave us content to work for him. Like we never did any servicing for him. He just paid and then mm -hmm. never messaged me back. But that was the first ever client I got and he was really, he was really easy to sell. He said, hey man, I don't really care what your presentation is. Here's a Google Doc. Write down 10 things that you'll do for me. We'll move forward. And from that, um, that day, I sold four more clients. And then I kind of quit the job that I had currently, which was door knocking for solar, which was appointment setting. And then okay. I just never looked back. <laughs> so door knocking for solar, you're in sales. How long did that last before, before you oh, jumped off that boat? That was a long five months, a very long wow. five months. So did you get into that just because just like, I need to make money, I'm going to hustle. And this is the first thing I came across your desk. So I knew that I would be good at it. And I knew that I would make more money. Um, realistically, I looked up, okay, sales on Google, waiting for the ads to pop up LinkedIn, I was the first one, screw it, applied, and then I got a call the next day. And that's just what I had to do. I looked at it as it was only $16 an hour, like you can go work at Amazon for 19, etc. Firstly, uh, I was pretty decent. So I got like a bunch of bonuses. Then secondly, I feel like sales is something that everyone has to learn. And I saw that as a free opportunity to be able to learn a skill set. I love it. I love it. Imposter syndrome. Did that ever, was that ever an issue for you? I felt like my mindset is very arrogant. I think I'm the best at everything until um, I get proven by the world that I'm not every single day. But um, it's never something that I really struggled with. It was just more so if I can do it, um, I'm going to at least try to. And mm. if it doesn't work out, that's a good thing about social media. If you do have imposter syndrome, if what you put out is bad, nobody will see it. But if what you put out is good, it will get pushed because people are watching it and people are engaging with it. So everybody will see it. So there's really no risk whenever it comes to posting something. Yeah. And what about for your clients? Like so, some of them, they're probably just like, I want that same, you know, what, what do you guys call it? Riz, right? <laughs> you know, that presence on, right. on in front of the camera. But when they struggle with that, how do you? Would you, how do you help them to kind of just project better to, to kind of own their authority? 
So typically, so what we did is we, after the first month, I went like completely premium. I figured I am solving rich people problems. Um, so typically the clients that we got were already doing eight figures. Like they, they spoke pretty well. They were pretty established yeah. within business. So I didn't really have that problem to begin with. Now, whenever we started going a little bit more, I don't want to say low hanging fruits, but for lack of better terms, that's what I'll go with. Um, we started to run into that issue a little bit. Uh, so what we do is you write out the tonality for the clients in the scripting process. And I do that for myself as well. So I'll color code, um, let's say for example, uh, yellow means emphasize. So I'll color code to my script on what I need to speak in that tonality. So if I um, yellow code you, then I know to emphasize you whenever I'm speaking to the camera. And that's really helped for me and then as well as for the clients that had that issue. I see. And are all the videos that you're putting out on Instagram, are those scripted word for word? Word for word. I suck whenever I don't have a script. Dude, you're doing okay right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and well, I, I, you know, I, I would say that I, I am really impressed with how tight your Instagram content is. But are, do you are you thinking of doing longer form stuff or other formats as well for yourself? One hundred percent. Like that is my main goal. We currently have six videos that are currently like recorded and edited, ready to post. It's just more so. I didn't have any incentivization to post right now because I'm not currently selling anything. But then mm -hmm. starting tomorrow, uh, we'll start looking more towards actually posting the YouTube content. But I do encourage everyone to create YouTube content. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube is what what do they call it? The 800 pound gorilla, right? Like yeah. it's it's got the most competition. However, the people who stuck around it for stuck around and actually, you know, mastered that there is so much more potential that that spawns out from that in every direction. And it's, it's kind of crazy. It's a lot um, easier to trust someone from a short form video and in, in comparison to a short form video, a short form video is yeah. 30 seconds and you're trying to steal their attention rather than a YouTube video. You're, you're sitting there watching them for eight to 10 minutes and it's just them talking yeah. about a specific subject. It's a lot easier to trust. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what kind of businesses do you think need video and are there any that don't? So I would say this might be a little bit biased because it's my job, but I think every business needs video. Uh, one thing that I've been looking like into is UTC. And one of the biggest pioneers for that would be, I think, Jake from State Farm. Uh, I would personally not know State Farm, or at least it wouldn't be such a household name to me personally, if it wasn't for the commercial Jake from State Farm. And now if you look up Jake from St State Farm, that's a literally like that's a social media profile. Um, yeah. So I think anywhere from insurance to obviously the people that are selling uh, digital products like info products and digital services, they definitely need a social media, but I think it's going to become more prevalent across every single business. Got it. 100% makes sense. Um, buying versus earning versus uh, just having fake engagement on social media. Tell me like, I, I know the obvious thing is like, don't do it. Right. But so, so many people are tempted, you know, cause you get a thousand people in your inbox every day. I'm going to, you know, buy this many followers for you and stuff. Um, have you seen instances where you brought on a client and then they just have a whole bunch of fake followers and you're like, oh, we need to clean this up. Like what, how does that hurt? Or like what, what's the actual side effects of actually, you know, going for these agencies, like for example, path social and stuff that are all over my feed these days. Tell me what that does. If you go with that. So the first thing is I always ask my client, I think the first mistake is it will mess with your mindset. Uh, whenever someone asks me that question within the program or whoever, they'll ask me, hey, what do you think about this? Can I do this? I'll ask them, if you got 100 million views per video, would you do this? No, of course not. So stop thinking short form, stop thinking short term and then start thinking long term on how you can get there. Then secondly, there are, I would say, detrimental like effects to it. Let's say, for example, you, you pay shout out pages. It's probably like the most popular thing now. Um, if you are a, an, an accountant and you pay a shout out page, the most typical shout out pages are going to be the motivational pages with the guy that we're not allowed to talk about, but everybody knows the guy that we're not allowed to talk about. Think about if you're paying that person to shout you out on their story and all they post to get the attention is the motivational content, what audience are you bringing on to your page now? So let's say, for example, you're paying a motivational content page to repurpose your content. Now you're getting a bunch of people that watch motivational content. Now think about who the people that need to watch motivational content. Typically, it's going to be the 19-year-olds my age that don't have any money. Now your audience is screwed and you pretty much screwed your account in the sense of nobody that's currently watching your videos is valuable. Um, and then as well as there's just, I would say social proof. That's one of the issues. For example, if you have a million followers and you get a thousand views, that looks a little bit sketchy across no matter like which way you look at it. So I think that there's just no real benefit to purchasing followers other than, yeah, I don't think there's really a benefit. I just see nothing maybe, with downsides. 
Yeah. I mean, temporarily, like if you're an influencer, then you might be able to land the brand deal because you could yeah. kind of, you know, make your account look more pretty with, with big numbers. But the in the end, the sponsors are the ones that are going to suffer and then they're not going to re-sign you because they're just like, yeah, you know, 10 million followers, but zero sales. So, you know, the, you might get the first gig, but that's so short term, right? Yeah, definitely short term. All right. Uh, tell me about, I got a question here, batching your videos or doing them a one at a time. Uh, I When I looked at your feed, I noticed that, okay, there's you know six in a row that look like they're shot right in a row. So I, I'm, I'm guessing that you do batch to some degree. Tell me about your your schedule for how you shoot. How do you like manage your energy like different times a day and, and or like inspiration is how, how much is that a factor in when you shoot your videos? Okay, I really like this question a lot. Okay. So I am a prime advocate to not batch your content. And it's for a couple of reasons. Okay. <laughs> now, I will say if you go look at my page, I will be batching some of my content. That's just because I'm traveling and I need to post. But aside from that, I will never batch my content just because of firstly, let's say, for example, you're batching in a 30-day batch. So you're, you're recording 12 times a year. You're only getting better 12 times a year versus if you did a weekly batch, you'd be getting better at a four times rate. Now, if a daily batch, you could be getting better by a... It depends on the 365 times X rate. My thought process around that is if the more you do something, the more, the more reps that you get, the stronger you will get in that skill set. So that's my first argument. And then as well as my second argument is, let's say, for example, you are in the news niche. If you have 30 days worth of content already bashed up and you just recorded yesterday, but then if a country goes to war tomorrow, now you have to wait 30 days until your next content batch to be able to cover the new trending topic. I don't really see a benefit in batching content other than saving time, but uh, I optimize to do something the best way I possibly can rather than do it the fastest that I can. That makes sense. Now, when you've got a client who's a CEO yeah. and they're just like, hey, I've got four hours a month <laughs> to commit toward content creation, what do you? how do you work with them? So yeah, that's like the typical thing they would work around. Um, so what we do for all of our clients is it's bi-weekly. Um, we had to sacrifice the weekly. We used to make them do weekly, but they, they didn't want to do that. So <laughs> yeah, we do bi-weekly. You get an eight-figure CEO to yeah. do weekly. That's you'd, you'd have to be like, you know, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <to> quit to <laughs> that. <laughs> we had some chop off, <laughs> but we had to go to a bi-weekly and that's like been the sweet spot for everybody. You still get to be able to get better content more frequently than you would monthly. But um, you still get the idea of saving time. Realistically, 14 videos takes around maybe two hours to record if, you, if you're bad. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can knock it out within an hour and a half if you just are effective with it. Got it. Got it. Right now, um, who are you keeping an eye on in like the social media content creation slash business realm where you're like, that's my, well, at least for now, that's my North Star. That's, I feel like that person is doing a really good job and I'm getting a lot of inspiration from them. Anybody that you care to share? Within my niche, I would say I don't really have anybody. Within the social, like the social media coach, if you were to take all of their average views and multiply it by two, it still would not be half of mine. So I'm not really looking at the, the people within my niche. However, there are some guys that are outside of my niche that are in, in I would say, more of a broad niche that do pretty well. Uh, I think Toozer is someone that a lot of people need to look up. T-O-O-Z-E-R. He's doing really well. He's in like the side hustle niche and he's selling a drop shipping course, I believe. And he's doing yeah. very well financially um, just because of his content, all of it's organic. That's one guy that I think is doing really, really well. Um, and I would say that's pretty much like the only guy that I personally watch and like think, okay, this guy does this better than me. Again, Amazing. arrogance. Um, but I would say that guy's pretty good. Really good. Uh, you know, I, I got to go check him out again. Tell me, has anyone ever told you you have a, like a Kobe Bryant attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, they have. Okay. So I'm not the yeah. first one. Like having yeah. this conversation with you, I'm finding a different side of you than what I see on your Instagram feed because on Instagram feed, everything is, you know, scripted. Right. And as it should be, but right now, uh, like the level of confidence you have and the level of, you just said, you know, like, Hey, there's no one else who is doing as well as me right now. I'm just like, that sounds like Kobe. And then you also talk about how hard you work at every, you know, like outpace, outpractice, outwork everybody in your, in your class. Right. Um, tell me like, do you, did you ever intentionally take any motivation or try to learn lessons from Kobe? No, uh, I didn't like basketball. I never was, I'm 5'10". So it was always out of the question for me. Okay. All good. Yeah. 
tell me about what, uh, what's the most common mistake that you're seeing when, uh, when you bring on a new client. And when I say that, it's like nails on a chalkboard, like, Oh, that again, can't stand it. You know, like why can't people learn their freaking lessons? Like what's, what's the recurring one? Let's say top two. Top two. Um, okay. I can't think of two. I can't think of one and I can, it's very, very prominent one that I see pretty much across all of the people that join my program is they treat social media as a sales, like it's a paid ad. Like they Mm. script their videos as if it's a paid ad. Now, so that's probably the biggest mistake. Um, Firstly, you got to think about who you're competing with. Uh, The audience and the mental state of people that are currently scrolling through short form content, they just saw a really, they saw a 10 out of 10 girl above. Then they saw a funny cat video. And then we scrolled onto your video. They most likely don't want education. They for sure do not want education and then to be sold for more education. So it's keeping that in mind of the mental state of the audience and being able to frame your information, not as medicine, but as candy for them to eat rather than to fix their problems. Got it. Got it. When you see them making that mistake and then you know what to do, right? Like, how do you help them shift? Like, is this just you telling them straight up, stop doing that crap and do this instead? Or do you like, do you have to take them through some kind of like a, uh, you know, a metaphor or some kind of a process so they can see the results? So I will never say stop doing something and never give them like the mythology on why I believe so. So the main thing that I do is like to, I like to make it seem like it's their idea. So I'll ask them, Hey, um, who do you want to resemble within your content? And it's always the same answer as everybody else, Alex and Mosey. So then I'll ask them, okay, when's the last time you ever heard Alex and Mosey sell something within his content? Never. Amazing. And then they just pretty much sell themselves into it. Now, of course, not everybody, we're not all, none of us are in with the position of Alex and Mosey. We didn't sell a company for 30 million, but um, what I found is that people will find you if they want to buy from you pretty easily. So I look at it as put out, put out good information, then you'll get good feedback. I love that. Love that. Uh, question about the uh, kind of the stages of you going through, just getting started to where you are right now, about kind of like where you're going to. In the beginning, I'm going to assume you were doing everything. You were doing all your own research. You are you know, setting up your lights, your microphone, your camera, you're hitting record, then going into Premiere or After Effects or whatever, you, you know, Final Cut, I don't know, editing all the motion graphics and then uploading it. Um, tell me how long it took you to learn those skills and also the transition into right now. Are you still doing everything yourself or do you have team helping you with some of that? Okay. So at the beginning, I never, ever edited my video. That seems nice. disgusting to me. Yeah. You, you that know, just... that's, this is the second surprise so far on this interview. Yeah. Number one, don't batch. Number two, don't edit. So walk me through this. This is really interesting. I hate editing. Um, realistically, you should not be taking three hours to do something that someone else would do it for $5 an hour. I could never see myself doing it. I never saw myself doing it. I was poor and I still didn't do it. I paid someone else too. Um, that's the first thing I would never do. Um, so from the very beginning... Uh, how, yeah. how did you find this editor? Because I think everybody's drooling over right now. It's like, I don't have to edit. You know, like, so is this okay. a friend or d- Craigslist or what? So I will say I was in a different position. Um, I came from a sense of, like, I was a gamer. So I already had, like, a community of other gamers that were editors that edited my gaming content beforehand. So I just kind of carried that over. But for the people that don't have that same scenario, uh, there's a bunch of different places you can find them. Uh, Facebook is a really good place. They have a bunch of different Facebook groups, especially a Philippine editor, Indian editor, anything that is going to be in the third world countries. Um, they typically have a group for those editors that you can get for cheap. Onlinejobs.ph, most people know about that. If you don't, check it out. It's pretty simple and pretty easy to use. Then the other two places would obviously be Fiverr and Upwork. You never want to actually pay those people within platform. Now, it is, it is against their terms of service to like, be like, hey, Take bro. Off, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They, they filter all your words now when you're chatting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to filter out your words. Hey, man, you ready for an interview? Hop on the Zoom call. Screw Fiverr. Screw Upwork. Hey, bro, I want you to come join my company, blah, blah, blah. Edit for me. And then from there, you just take them off the platform. Got it. And wh- do you bring people on like a per video kind of rate or uh, like a per month? Like what? Tell me about that. I don't pay anybody by the hour or yeah. salary it is okay okay salary for different positions but for video editors no i don't care how long it took i don't care what you had to do to get it done all i care about is that you got it done um so i just pay people keep i pay people by the video yeah like for for the level of quality that you're doing right now could you give us a ballpark like what's one video okay so for my like my, my personal post so yeah. 
okay my videos typically take like it's a, a substantial amount of time around 12 to 16 hours to edit including the revisions so it's just like for that you're going to need to pay a prettier penny and then as well as the quality of my video you can't like it, it's harder to find i would say for my style of video i would crack off maybe 75 dollars at the minimum if you want it uh, completely hands off and that's at the very very minimum if you find someone really good i would say 100 and twenty five dollars would probably be like the standard rates for my quality, but my quality is like that's what I build my business on is my quality of videos. So you don't have to have like a similar quality of video. It can be much much less, and you still perform quite well. If you just scroll through TikTok right now, you would scroll through and you would see none of the videos that look like mine. You'd see no videos that are highly edited. Like you don't need an editor that's really really good. I would say a good price for a decent editor would be anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars, and I think that that would be completely fair. As assuming that they're overseas. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for that. I think that, you know, a lot of people don't talk about this publicly, but, you know, I think a lot of listeners are looking for that, that other layer, like they want to be like you and these, these hints are going to be really valuable. So I appreciate it. Of course. Okay. There's so much talk nowadays. Uh, you do this and a lot of other people do this just about, Hey, here's 20 viral hooks. Here's this hook and that hook. Now, do you think that this is going to be something that is going to continue to be paramount to engagement or do you think that there's do you see any shift in the in the landscape where the there's other things that are going to be more important than just you know grabbing the first three to five seconds of attention i mean i think i think the 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 quick like the beginning of your video is always going to be the most important no matter what because if they don't watch the beginning they don't watch anything else after that so i think the whole idea of hooks being the most important will never change i think how you portray the hook and how you speak the hook is going to change because beforehand competition was a lot less um dopamine levels were a lot less and then as well as the watch time on videos was a lot more prior 2020 so nowadays i would say the hooks are still going to be just as important you just have to be better at portraying them and how you speak them and it's going to have to speak to an emotion rather than just being here's my secret way on how to how to get more views mm. And how do you balance that? Like there's the hook and the structure of your video, right? And you have a lot of great frameworks. And then there's the, I'm going to call it the Riz, you know, like right. the, the balance between that. Someone could be a total, you know, dead energy kind of person, but have great, you know, structure. And I would say that's someone like, for example, uh, Jordan Peterson, he doesn't do uh, short form necessarily, but you know, the, the stuff he says is so good that even though he speaks in this kind of just kind of monotone way of presenting, it doesn't matter. But then you've got other people who say stupid stuff, but with, you know, so much more character. Are you seeing like any difference in your stuff or in your client stuff? I, I think just going for the balance. I mean, um, depends on the information on who you're speaking to and then as well as who you're like, what your what information you're giving, then who you're speaking the information to. Yeah. Jordan Peterson will typically be speaking to a, a more educated human being, and for that, they're probably going to have a little bit of a better attention span than someone that's a little bit less educated that just wants comedy videos. Um, I think it just depends on what audience you're trying to attract, and you will attract whoever you are. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Tell me about uh, when you first started posting stuff: friends, family, mom, <laughs> dad, cousins, uh, you know, school mates, like. Uh, what was their general reaction? Like supportive, a few people just calling you a clown, like wannabe. Uh, tell me about that. I mean, I didn't really have any negative backlash. I mean, like other than like my like friend groups, uh, I didn't have any like negative backlash that was just like uncalled for. Uh, family, um, family always knew that like they were a little bit disappointed that I wasn't going down like the normal route, like every other parents. Um, but they always knew that it was either this or homeless. So they were kind of at terms with it so they weren't necessarily this or supportive. homeless yeah this or homeless. <laughs> how does that work <laughs> um because you didn't want to have a, re a traditional job like from the beginning was that like something that's always been in your since like 13 like your psyche i yeah. knew there was no chance that i would clock in and listen to someone else um just not within my i don't want to say not within your nature can only speak, speaking over things that you can't change but mm -hmm. it's just not something i was going to do um so it's either this or homeless but Makes sense. Uh, yeah, they understood that uh, they tried for the past before I was 18 for the past five years to get me try to to get me to start paying attention to school and stuff like that wasn't happening. They pretty much gave up and said, you know what, whatever he does, he does. So parents was good. Um, I will say um, it was a little bit embarrassing, like not embarrassing, but it put the burden of performance onto you to actually make it work because 
if you did this and it didn't work and you have everyone that followed you beforehand, like I had 700 people following me from school, like real life people that like saw me post this random stuff that was kind of weird to them, yeah. especially, especially unknown. They know me as Devin, not as a content guy. So I look at it as just like a burden of performance. If this works out, it's like, okay, everything's all good. If it doesn't work out, then I will get clowned. Mm. Yeah, it's just, you know, let let the results speak for themselves, right? Yeah. It's it's interesting. My now. brother did the same thing. He's got, you know, I think close to a million followers on Instagram and, and uh, YouTube and stuff. But when he started, he was on Facebook and all his friends were like, uh, you know, like, hey, who are you trying to be an influencer or whatever? And what he did to just block out the negativity was he said, I'm going to just do something completely new where my friends are not. And that was YouTube. And he just switched platforms because he just didn't want any of the, the, the past drama and history following him. And that's when he was able to focus on his content. And yeah, he's, you know, he's got, uh, you know, several million dollars a year in his business just off of YouTube. So that's, it's so important to, to have the right people, you know, uh, uh, like occupy your attention at any given time. Otherwise you're just, just going to go off in a random direction. Yeah. I agree. So here's something I'm curious about AI. How is that? Uh, I, I'm going to assume that since what you're doing is relatively new, you had a pretty early start, but there was probably a time where you didn't have it and using it to where you did. What has changed as a result of that? I would say transcription tools. I would say it's probably the easiest thing that I utilize the most whenever it comes to AI. Um, how to say different things. That's something that I personally use a lot. So for example, if I am if I would rather say something other than she would, um, I would say what are some other alternatives to saying she would, she could, okay. That sounds good. Um, that's probably like the main thing, the main use mm -hmm. case that I found. Transcription, I use dovetail.com, I believe it is, or .app, mm -hmm. something like that. And it transcribes videos for me. Uh, personally, I'm a big believer in not throw shit at the wall. Uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Look at, what, look at what's working and then try to imitate it and make it better. Um, so if I want everyone to take inspiration from another video, upload it to Dovetail, gives me the transcript. I can sit there and look at the script. Why did this perform well? What is the mm -hmm. pattern within the script? Cool, take the pattern. Now script it out yourself. Makes sense. Other than that, I don't think that there's much each case. I mean, like, I don't think it's to the point where you can keep somebody's attention with what AI writes. No, no. It, it, it'll help you clean it up, but that's yeah. about it. Like, I, what I do sometimes is, like, I say something, I'm just like, I, I'm bored reading my own stuff. And then I'll just have it shorten it. I'm just like, okay, that's better. It's more to the point. Yeah. Cut out the fluff. 100%. Um, there's... I've seen your content go out. Some of your really great videos. I think one of the ones that that stood out was the one about how you could take, you know, one idea, break it into three subcategories, and then six subcategories beyond that, and you created the content wheel or something. Yeah. Visually, very, very, you know, explanatory. And then I saw about five or six other people literally rip you off, they, like almost word for word, and the same graphics, different colors, pretty much, and different face. How do you feel when that happens? And I'm sure you've seen those too, right? Like over and over yeah, people call me stuff. Yeah, I get added in those a lot. I mean, to be honest with you, there was a guy named, I think his name is Buse Brain. I mean, he created the concept. I mean, it was a lot different than my video, but he created the concept of like having the different subtopics. So it's more so in like a roadmap rather than the visual that I created. But like everything that you see is stolen, no matter, no matter what, everybody got their information from someone else. So it's just like, if... If somebody else takes my information, it's just I don't necessarily care. I mean, I think that my video performed better than all all of theirs. If their if their videos perform better than mine, then I might get a little bit emotional about it. But until that happens, it doesn't really matter to me. Dude, you're such a Kobe. <laughs> 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 I love that. Uh, it should be like, uh, yeah, no, I I'm not even gonna go there because you don't do basketball. Right. Okay. Now, before we we started this interview, I asked you a question and. And most people would jump at this and be like, yeah, 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 I got this book and stuff. And I asked you the questions like, hey, is there something you want to pitch? And he said, no, I don't pitch. Tell me about your philosophy around that. And I know we touched on it lightly with your clients wanting to pitch everything and change. But let's go a little bit deeper. Like, really, uh, like, you seem to have this level of confidence where you're like, my, my content will do the work for me. And it will show up for me. And I will not have to pitch. Was there a time? when you had to turn that around, like you said that you were in, in solar, uh, door, solar sales door knocking, that is just pure pitching pretty much, right? Pure pitching. Uh, yeah. And maybe is, is it like, like, uh, you know, wanting to go far as far as possible in the opposite direction where you never pitch, uh, 
could you could you kind of walk me through the philosophy and how you came upon this? I've never been a sales guy. Like I've never been a sales guy. I, I'm like I'm pretty decent at it, but it's just not something I've ever done. Like even the people that I get on a sales call, like I just have a pitch deck, and it's just like we'll run through the pres- presentation. Sound good? Yay? Nay? No? Okay. Have a nice day, man. Nice talking to you. I'm not one to handle objections, so that's just always been me. Um, now I will say the philosophy came from. I never bought from somebody that asked me to buy. It's just more so um, I have trust within this person on whatever I bought will be valuable. And I think that's the main thing that um, I focus on, that my philosophy. If I build up so much pre-assumption towards the value that I will provide, uh, if I give you 18 different videos that all add value to your life, then it's kind of like looking at it from the viewer standpoint. Well, if I got this much value out of the free stuff, what the fuck is in these paid stuff? Because that's exactly what I think whenever I watch other guys' stuff. Um so I just look at what I bought and why I bought it. And then, cool. How can I sell to more people like me? Um, yeah, for the pitching thing, I didn't want to pitch here just because uh, I sell organic traffic. And like how, that's how I do business. And I teach other people how to do that themselves. I don't want it to be, I don't want to do something that would be against what I sell on how I get my customers, if that makes sense. If I'm as good as I think I am, then I will get it doing it th- at the thing that I'm teaching. Mm, I love that. Thank you for that. Right now, when you're when you're helping your your clients, what's the majority of your time going to? Is it scripting? Is it research and somebody else scripts? Like, like where do you see your genius that it's got to be you versus stuff that you could get help with? For example, you told me you don't edit, so we know that that's out of the picture. Um, how do you divide that? Okay, so I'll give you the rundown of like what uh, I have help with. So the two main things, obviously editing, then the other thing is content research. I think content ideation, we have different content researchers. And then from that, the structure on how they present to me the ideas is the video link itself to whatever source they took it from, whether it's Reddit, whether it's a TikTok video, Quora.com, anything they took it from, cool, they take it from there. They give me the concept that it's teaching. So what is the concept of the video about? An example on how I can use it within my own content, and then as well as a quick summary of the idea itself. That way I don't have to waste time if I don't like it. Then from that, I can rate the idea from one to five stars. And then um, they can kind of curate my ideation across that from the ratings. And that's how I personally work within my own company, as well as my own clients whenever we do ideation for them. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's one key thing that I would outsource if you can is ideation, having somebody bring you the ideas and then you creating your, you taking that as inspiration and then creating your own videos. That saves a lot of time for me, especially. Then as well as the clients as well. Um, What was your original question I got? I guess that's right. Like, w- where do you spend your time? That's your zone of genius oh, okay. that that you would not hire someone to do, at least not right now. So scripting, um, I don't even script to my clients anymore. Like what we used to do. The thing apart, the thing with scripting is, I would not let anyone script your videos because, firstly, um, that's what we did to begin with. Is we offered scripting because it was the most desirable thing um, that for for a lot of different people. So the biggest issue I ran into whenever I was scripting for clients is that, firstly, I'm 19. I speak as a 19 year old. If you are a 40-year-old CEO to a company, you don't want to, you don't want to sound or come off in the way that I come off. Um, so that's number one. Secondly, I'll never have as much information or knowledge about the topic that you're currently speaking on. So for example, we had clients that were traders. I don't know how to buy a stock. I cannot write the script for you, man. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, so that, that's number two. And then as well as number three, um, wh- well, what we did do is we did advise the script to where we would we would rework it and make it more optimized for engagement. So they'd give me the initial information. And then from there, I would script it out. That would be the only thing that I would be necessarily attached to, but I don't even do that anymore just because I now have re re I've done it for so long and I've done hundred scripts a week for like six months. Now I've reverse engineered all of my processes and kind of just like give it to all the people that buy into my program now. And from that, mm-hmm. they can kind of learn pretty quickly. All right. Perfect. I think I want to join your program. Sounds awesome. Uh, <laughs> The the I'm gonna go back one step to the question earlier about uh, the researchers. How do you find slash train these researchers? Are, is there a certain like a uh, job title that if I put that up on LinkedIn, people are just like, oh, that's me? That it attracts the right kind of people. So I made it. Um, I just thought one day, hey, this would be nice. Uh, I don't necessarily know what other people call it, and I don't know if that's like an actual job. Uh, Personally, I have a brand and I cop out my brand. All my count, all of my talent comes from my brand. And that's something like one of the sales pits. That's something like on the sales side of like selling my service is that there's so many lagging indicators. For example, mm-hmm. you get invited on to podcast. You get good people reaching out to you for talent, make an Instagram story, and then have 5,000 people apply to whatever 
job position that's open. Um, but yeah, that's how I got them. Uh, I just said, hey, content researcher, you want to make money watching TikTok? Fill out this application. Um, Perfect. What, I, what I look for are people that are very organized, that ask, ask a lot of questions, and then as well as are really, is really, really good at noticing patterns. Those are the three things I look for within a researcher. All right. And do you do you do them uh, take them through a test project just to make sure that they're there or yeah? So yeah. what okay. we do at the beginning is we have the form, and then on the form it's like all the basic general questions, and then I'll ask, and then at the bottom I'll put an optional, I mean like an optional section. Hey man, if you want to, if you want to put in the extra work, um, give me three ideas in the form. Anybody that puts those three ideas automatically send them on to the first trial. Anybody that does not put those three ideas and put. 45 minutes giving their perfect resume, X, Y, and Z, goes in the trash. If you don't do the extra work, you go in the trash. People that do the extra work, they go into the first trial to where they will find 15 ideas for me. And then if they make it past the first trial, they go into the second trial to where they will find 25 ideas for one of the clients. And then if they make it past that, we have the batch of like five or 10 of the best researchers. And then from that, we'll say, okay, we'll do a paid trial, find content ideas for all of my clients. And then I'll give them 100 bucks to, well, not all of the clients, like 10 clients. And then um, I'll give them a hundred bucks to do the pay trial. All right. That works. All right, Devin, we're running out of time. Uh, very last question. Uh, talking to a business owner who's doing, let's just say, uh, for the sake of argument, um, $2 million a year, right? They're in the services industry, whether they might be a lawyer, uh, doctor, uh, agency owner, or maybe an information coach, but, but they're not on video. Like they, they've got the money, they got the business, but they haven't jumped into putting their face on video. What advice do you give that person? What would you say to them? Pay the right people, just like everything else. Um, if, you want a video, if you want a videographer, pay the right videographer. Uh, if you want to get someone to build your house, don't try to do it yourself. Pay the right people. Um, there's a bunch of guys that are within the space that know what they're talking about, um, Ken being one of them. So um, look at who you resonate with the most. Look at who creates content the way you want to create content and then pay them. If you make $2 million a year, that's what I would do personally. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time, Devin. I appreciate it. And uh, I will put links down below. If you're listening to the podcast, check out the show notes. If you're on YouTube, look at the description down below to uh, find Devin on all his different channels. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. No hustle, rush, repair, wear a different breed. Action is what we got if action is what you need. Content capitalists, we're breaking the mold. Because the old ways fade, new stories to be told. So content capitalists, get to the prize.